what drew you towards this sort of recommendation or this sort of, you know, I guess for diabetes or maybe for other, other conditions I, I've seen, you know, personally, I'm this crazy guy telling people to eat a bunch of meat and I'm seeing, you know, you know, I just see where disease is getting, getting fixed, you know, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, hypertension, all kinds of stuff, mental health stuff. What drew you towards that? You know, where, where were you at and what made you made to change? I assume you did change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was I was a loyal dietitian to the to the good old food pyramid and the food nutrition guidelines, and it was healthy whole grains, low fat. I mean, the whole the whole thing. Um, up until about nine or so years ago, um, and it's fair to say that even you know five or ten years before that, when Atkins started to come out, you know, do the rounds, I um, conveniently made it go away, which is kind of Kind of interesting, you know, when you reflect on how you how you sort of poo pooed certain certain ways of thinking, and I don't know if that's a, just a maturity thing or or what. Um, but yeah, it was the last sort of nine years, and it really it really started from a couple of conversations um, that I had with my colleagues, and one of them was was Professor Grant Schofield, um, who you know he, he was always kind of well ensconced in the physical activity um you know domain that was his his training his background and um i would always have this kind of little protection of the patch when it came to nutrition which is so ridiculous looking back i mean god my world has just totally changed but you know i was the one who would to, who would be allowed to talk about nutrition and if you weren't qualified with nutrition calls you weren't really permitted to talk about nutrition Anyway, we were having a conversation one day and he was talking to me. We were just getting into the area of insulin resistance and we had a PhD student who was looking at hyperinsulinemia and I was brought on board as a secondary supervisor for this PhD student just because I was like a healthy skeptic and I'd always provide the kind of other, the other side of the argument. Anyway, so he was saying to me, um, so type 2 diabetes is characterized by insulin resistance. We started talking about what that meant. And then he said, so dietary management of type 2 diabetes is what? I said, well, you know, healthy whole grains, 45 to 60% of your, your diet is carbohydrates and blah, blah, blah. And he asked a very, very simple question. And he said, why? What, what is the reason why we manage a condition of insulin resistance with the very thing that our bodies struggle to process under the conditions of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia? And and it just sort of stopped me in my tracks. No one had really asked me that before. And, you know, of course, I was really defensive and said, you know, there must be a good reason. It must be for all those, you know, the fiber and the B vitamins and all that stuff that, you know, people people say you need from whole grains. So there must be a reason for it. And um, and that kind of prompted me to, to do a re really deep dive into the literature and revisiting some of the rationale for low carb and some of the physiology by chemistry around it. And it, it, it was, it just kind of blew me away. In fact, there was a time there probably for about three or four months that I thought, what am I, what am I going to, what am I going to do with this information? It's that whole, that whole cliche of once you see something, you can't unsee it. And I was in a real quandary, you know, what do I do with my career? I think I actually need to, get out of this because I, I just don't know how to handle this. Um, and it kind of morphed from there. And then, you know, Tim Noakes came on board with Benting and it all kind of slowly moved to where, um, where I got to and where I am now, which is totally convinced that um, that is definitely the way forward for not only type 2 diabetes, but a range of conditions. And to be to be fair, I think for overall for general health, um, being a proponent of whole food, if you really look at what whole food is and you really truly eat a good definition of whole food, it's going to end up being low in carbohydrate, high in protein and fat anyway. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you might get a, a lot more fiber, you know, because but you're not getting much else, uh, you know, as far as that, but the macronutrients tend to be there. Um, so when you said, you know, you used to defend them and, you know, there's, there's, there's a, clearly it's still a counter argument, you know, we should not be giving diabetics, low, low carb diets, ketogenic diets, you know, feeding them meat and eggs or whatever. Um, what is the criticism? You know, what, what is, what is the argument? And then how do you, how do you sort of say that that, that argument doesn't make sense? I mean, what is the rationale for saying what, what we're doing is bad? 
Yeah, I mean, there the are a few arguments that people use. The first one is the, the, the classic default is, well, carbohydrate is the main fuel of energy for the body, which, as we know, is not necessarily true. It is one, it is one of several fuels. So, you know, that whole argument of carbohydrate being an essential nutrient and all that can be debunked with physiology quite nicely. So that falls down. The other, the other argument is about um, micronutrients. So if you have a low-carb diet, um, you're going to be devoid of fiber and micronutrient, and that is absolute nonsense. In fact, um, I've just recently published um, two papers with some colleagues in Australia looking at analyzing the micronutrient status of low-carb diets for adults and also for children. Not keto diets, but low-carb diets around sort of 60 to 80 grams of carbohydrates, um, which is still pretty low-carb, about you know maybe 20% of total energy. And um, interestingly, if a diet is well planned, and that is the that is the kicker, if the diet is well planned and well organized, it can be rich in micronutrients and is often richer in fiber than a diet that follows kind of standard guidelines. So the whole micronutrient and fiber argument is a moot point. It, it's ridiculous. You've just got to you just got to understand food composition and know where you get your nutrients from for that to be sorted. Um, the third one is a little bit more of a challenge, and as you know, there's a you know there's a global kind of argument about the whole lipid thing, um, and you know having lots of saturated fat will raise your LDL, and that will result in heart disease. And you know that that science has moved, uh, but it hasn't quite moved to where we where it needs to move to to get everyone on board. Um, and I'm really um, I'm really glad that. Dave Feldman's recent paper on lean mass hyperresponders and higher LDL cholesterol with low carb diets has been um, has been finally published in black and white for everyone to see. It's not a it's not a, a you know it, it's a hypothesis paper, but you know he's been talking about this for a long time, and it's really really nice to see some of these arguments in, in black and white. So the whole kind of heart disease argument is what people what people talk about, um, and again I counter I often counter that with with a counter argument for, for you know saturated fat, um, LDL and and heart disease, but also the fact that you don't have to do a low carb diet with very high levels of saturated fat at all. And if that's a problem for you, then you can get more of a an even um, distribution of your monos, your polys, and your saturated fat. Um, so you know we, we we can still do a low carb diet for people who are skeptic about lipids and consequences of high saturated fat intake <laughs>